good parents, it's not about you. It's not about you being liked. It's not about whether they want to be around you. Absolutely, it has nothing to do with you. They may not like you. Welcome to parenthood. And you need to get present is what you need to do as a father for them. And that has to take a higher priority than your ego around whether your kids want to be around you or not. That's not your job. Your job is not to have them like you. Your job is to do your part as a father and let them know that they're loved whether they love you or not. I think you started last week, if I remember correctly. Yes, sir. I did. I'll, st- I'll start this week. Um, I saw a headline over the weekend that there is a woman in New York who uh, was arrested for confronting squatters in the house that her, if I remember correctly, her mother or her grandmother had left her when she died. And there's this big ordeal, not only in, in New York, but across the country, there's this squatting epidemic that, that I've actually looked into since I saw this article where people will just move into abandoned houses or not even abandoned, just vacant. I, I personally, I own a vacant home. It's not abandoned, Same. but it's vacant. And, and these people will move in and there's such a thing as squatters rights, if you didn't know that. Squatters rights. And these, these cities, counties, states, municipalities make it damn near impossible for a person who owns a home to evict, or not even evict, evict would, evict would make it sound as if that person had some sort of an arrangement for making payment. I'm not talking about yeah. evict, I'm talking about flat out remove trespassers, which is, because we use these terms, and this is what frustrates me, like squatting or you know, like tenant, no, that's a euphemism for trespasser, for criminal, for crook, for theft. Yeah. I, it just infuriates me. And I'm so sick and tired of the government, and I'm talking about city, county, state, federal governments, giving quote-unquote rights to individuals who don't deserve them. People who break the law, they're relinquishing rights. And by the way, there's no right to say that you get to live in somebody's house. That's not a right that we have identified as, as being part of this country. And that goes back to what we were talking about, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Illegal immigrants, they don't have rights because they're not American citizens. So they don't have the same rights that American citizens do. And I'm so frustrated with it. I'm so sick and tired of it. And, you know, look, I, what I'm tired of is I'm tired of people – having the same opinion, and then continuing to vote Democrat. Um, I'm tired of letting bleeding hearts who feel everything with their heart and nothing with their brain uh, dictate the tone of the conversation. Like, sure, we can be empathetic. We can try to figure out how these individuals without housing situations can actually get housing. We can, we can talk about that. But we're not going to let them steal from people who have houses or houses have been passed down We cannot let that happen. And it is infuriating to me that we have become a lawless country full of crooks, criminals, thugs who hate the police, who hate law and order, who hate this way of life, and who jeopardize everything else that this country and these these citizens of our country stand for. Hmm. There's my rant. Crazy. It's a good rant. So the question is, what do you do about it? That's the question. What do you do about it? Stop electing Democratic officials, you idiots. Like, do I had a, I saw on a post, there's a, a St. George, um, I live in St. George, or, or near St. George, Utah. There's a Facebook group that I belong to. And it's funny, it's mostly comical for me because there's so many people who cry and complain and bitch about <laughs> dumb things. And it's <laughs> funny to me, actually. Yeah. And somebody was like, oh, I hate prices in St. George. I'm like, well, first, it's not exclusive to St. George. And second, you're misattributing because there's a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, greedy landlords. You retard. It's not greedy landlords. It's the economic policies that our governments enact. So it's, for example, part of the reason that 
home values in St. George are so high is because people leave bad economic policies in California and they come here and they sell their homes in California for millions of dollars and then they come here and infuse a bunch of cash into the into the county. I don't have any problem with people spending their money how they want to spend it. In fact, as a homeowner, I appreciate them coming and paying over the market value for home prices. I don't mind that. But I don't like that they're fleeing bad economic policy and bringing that nonsense here. The other problem is that you have federal policy in the way of infusing billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars. The federal government just uh, passed a $1.2 trillion. Could be off a billion dollars or so, give or take, because it doesn't seem to matter. (laughs) $1.2 trillion spending package to avoid a government shutdown. I would love if the government shut down. I would love it. Yeah. There's elements of the government that do need to be shut down. And when you infuse billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, into uh, a market that we're dealing, a very volatile marketplace like we are now, you're going to inflate prices. It's, it's, It's inevitable. These people are so moronic. They're either idiots, ignorant, or, or evil, frankly, because they're doing it on purpose. So guys, Let's en- enough with Democrats, enough with liberals, enough with leftists. We cannot do this anymore. It is not sustainable. All right. Love it. That's what I had to share this morning. <laughs> My headline is, is more of a, like a public announcement benefit. So okay. Instagram, uh, here's the headline. Instagram us- uh, users were blindsided by the platform's sneaky rollout of a new content filtering tool limit of political content, a setting that the Mm. social media giant made default for many accounts without ever directly informing users. Saw this, checked, and my account was limited for political political content from users I don't follow. Oh, there's like a feature, something that you... An official setting in Instagram that everyone's default setting is to limit political content. And that's the default setting. So... And I bet it's not just political content. I bet it's certain political content. Yeah, I mean, the setting is political content, right? But why would you do that now? That's what it says. Right, and and, and it looks suspicious, of course, right? And so anyone that wants to see the setting, just literally on the gram, go to your settings, content preferences, and now there's a section called political content underneath content preferences, And you can change it so don't limit political content uh, from people that that you don't follow. So it's it's a really a setting of I don't want to see political content unless I follow them or vice versa. So settings, content preferences, political content. I don't even know how to. Okay, let's see. I'm going to look. Go to your profile. Yeah. So it's from your profile. My profile. Go to that hamburger menu. Yep. And then content preferences. Content prep. Okay, content preferences. Yep. And then political, political content. content. Yep. Limit political content from people you don't follow. Yeah. I mean, on the surface, it doesn't sound horrible. Yeah, because it's people you don't follow, right? Yeah, and I don't, yeah. don't want to hear a bunch of political content. Like, why would I be getting any content from people I don't follow. How about that? <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Like I, I realized Instagram, I, I was looking at it this morning. It's just become a filter of nonsense and ads. I'm like, I don't want ads on here. I mean, I know you got to make bit, make money. This is becoming, Facebook has done it too. Yeah. Well, you we need alternative email, email systems do it now. Yeah. You get that, a fake email. You know, that it's like, you're like, oh, I didn't subscribe to that. And you're like, oh, it's an ad showing up as an email in my inbox. I can't stand that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. So anyhow. All right. Well, there you go. There's your headlines, guys. Be aware. (laughs) Be awake. Know what's going on. And, you know, the other thing I would say, too, on this is I was trying really hard to avoid political conversation on this week's headlines, and I just can't avoid it. Um (laughs) I, I'm trying to think about how to tie this back into manliness and masculinity. Guys, get involved in po- politics. Don't be passive. I mean, so Stop I know so many of us are like, well, I don't, I don't want to deal with politics. I don't like politics. I don't deal with it. Deals with you. Yeah. 
It's, it's literally transforming your life before your eyes in some very obvious and not so obvious ways. So yeah, I mean, if you don't want to get involved, I get that. I understand that. But the reality of it is that the politics are impacting your life and they will impact your children's lives. And so you better get involved in one degree or, the no- or another. All right, let's get to some questions. All right, so we're going to field questions from the Instagram to follow Mr. Mickler there. It's at Ryan Mickler. First question, Cop Van Tarney. This is the great part about Instagram <laughs> usernames. Who knows? <laughs> totally. All right, a leadership trait you admire in someone you know. A leadership trait you admire in someone you know. Um, man, that's a God, leadership trait. And maybe just the I mean, leadership could, shape I, you admire, maybe. Yeah, I, well, I, there's a lot of, well, I mean, even with you, Kip, there's, there's things I admire about the way that you lead. You, you lead from a very, I, I don't know if I would say empathetic as much as I would use the word understanding. It seems to me like you strive to understand where people are coming from before you start rushing into solving problems or coming to conclusions or even drawing conclusions about why a person does a thing. To me, that's admirable. I don't, I, don't, I don't naturally have that trait, and it's not something I've cultivated personally, but when I see you interact with those people, it helps me take a pause because I tend to be more reactive and black and white. Uh, so, so I really value that in you. But then you have, you have other people like um, Jocko, I mean, with discipline, right? Just a very nonsensical approach to the way that, that he looks at life. And I, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, guys like Jordan Peterson with their, their vocabulary, their abstract, their interesting vocabulary. And, and I'm not even sure with Jordan Peterson, it's the ability to explain. Cause sometimes I feel like I'm just kind of bouncing around in his brain and it's a little confusing for me cause I'm a dumb guy, but I also appreciate just his vocabulary and his, his constant, quest to like seek and understand and curiosity Mm. uh and as and i'm deliberately picking him because i know i've been somewhat critical and and another person i've been a little bit critical of in the past is andrew huberman you know i don't i'm not gonna listen to his podcast i'm really not like i can't i don't have 17 hours to listen about why the retina does what it does i don't care (laughs) and why i need more sunlight i already know that but i also appreciate his ability to go deep and to really like really think we need people like that. It ain't me, but we need people like that. Um, man, I think there's, there's other guys who are animated. You know, one person that comes to mind is Tim Tebow. I love his passion. Mm. You know, he's just so passionate. Um, Terry Crews, has got so much energy, just full of life and energetic and excited about life. Matthew McConaughey yeah. uh, is somebody who's just fascinating and interesting and entertaining. Ben Shapiro's mind is is interesting to me and, and how he's a great debater. Like he can take a subject and just debate it so logically that even like no emotion stands a chance against Ben Shapiro. Yeah. Like to, I don't know. I try to learn from everybody. I see what everybody is doing. I was up in Zion National Park. I live basically the base of Zion National Park. It takes me about 25, 30 minutes to get up there. And I was sitting at at breakfast and uh, we were watching this family. And I really admired just the family, the parents, like all, like it was, it was a man and his, his wife, I assume, and two kids, two young kids, probably, I don't know, one, one and a half and maybe three or four. And they were all dressed really well. They were all interacting. The mom was playing with the kids. The dad was engaged. Like I watched them and I, that's leadership, you know, and I saw what they were doing and how it impacted their family and just the way that I perceived that to be on the, now you don't know the full story, but it looked pretty amazing. So I really try to learn something from everybody. And so there's a few examples for me. Yeah, I love that. Have you seen that meme video with the the girl with purple hair? She's like, I'm going to read Jordan Peterson's 12 rules book. I want him to exploit this guy. Have you seen that? 
Oh, no, maybe. I so don't she's know. holding his book. She's like, I'm going to read Jordan Peterson's book. I'm going to destroy this book. I'm going to expose him for the person that he is. And then it cuts to the next scene and their hair's normal and she's no longer <laughs> like a highly woke Oh, really? <laughs> it's that's super awesome. funny. I was like, and then she talks about how good the book is. I'm like, that's, that's so funny. That People is are hilarious. Funny. Wokeism, wokeism is a problem for sure. <laughs> and and I, I think if we're going to say wokeism, we need to explain what that is. To me, wokeism is synonymous with uh, victimhood. Yeah, it's a victim mindset. That that every everybody out there is a victim. It's power hier- hierarchies. That the only reason that somebody gets ahead is because they took advantage of somebody else. And the only thing people are interested in is power. And it comes at the expense of other people. And there's certain people that are the oppressors and some some people who are the oppressed. That's what wokeism yeah. is. And there is that. That is there is an element of that in society. Yeah. But broadly speaking, it isn't like that. It really and even capitalism. You the, I there's men who would consider themselves conservative who say they hate capitalism. Like you don't hate capitalism. You hate crony capitalism, you hate government subsidized capitalism, you hate Ex- exploitation, uh, greed, theft. I hate those things too, but that's not synonymous with capitalism. So yeah. it's people have miscategorized certain things and it's, it's, a, it's a danger. Yeah. Because it's not an accurate representation the way we make decisions based on misrepresentations of the reality. Totally. When you brought up something that, that I get pretty excited about talking about when we talk about victimhood and you, you, you pointed out you have the oppressor and the oppressed, right? But then you also have the rescuer. Mm. And, and that does the same thing. And that's the part where government and sometimes parents, where we fail as leaders, because we may stay away from the persecution, right? Well, I'm not going to persecute my people and oppress them, but I'll save them. Mm. I'll save them from their woes. And that in itself will perpetuate victim mindset as well. And those are the parts that well, we have to it, be really careful about. And also, if you want to be a hero, then everybody looks like a victim. Yeah. Yeah. So you're actually looking for problems that don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. If, it's like the old adage. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a hero... Everything, everybody looks like a, a victim. Totally. Maybe they're not. Yeah. And I think we also need to evaluate why we want to rescue people. Yeah. So if I see somebody egos. who's oppressed, yes, yeah. exactly. That's like, we hear this a lot, white knighting, right? You come in as the white knight to rescue the person or the damsel in distress. Well, maybe that person didn't need rescuing. Maybe yeah. the best thing you could have done for them is just kind of let them struggle for a minute. And make sure they're not going to die, of course. Yeah. But let them struggle for a minute and, you know, work through their issues. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting line in, what, what movie is it? Oh, it's Catch Me If You Can. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, yeah. That's a great movie. I love that movie. Yeah, Tom Hanks, show. Leo DiCaprio, Christopher Walker. And Christopher Walker has this line that he uses in his speeches where the, my, the mouse falls into a, a vat of milk. And he struggles and struggles so hard and struggles and struggles, and eventually he turns that milk into butter. And as it solidifies, he rescues himself. He saves himself because he struggled so hard that he turned the milk into butter and was able to walk out of that bucket that he, found, that he fell in. Like I, That's always stuck with me. Mm. struggle breeds strength and innovation and creativity and resilience and fortitude all the things that we need to be successful in life yeah and as rescuing we rob people from that growth opportunity from the confidence building all those other things yeah Yeah. absolutely super tough you know one leadership trait i just want to call out since since you're being so kind to me i'm just joking but but i do full honesty you you are really great at relinquishing and letting people operate with autonomy. It's always shocked me how often in the Iron Council I see you, like someone has an idea and you're like, yeah, sure. And you don't try to control it all. And you see the value in people having an autonomy with, with what they're doing. 
And that's always been very impressive. And I think even a lot of times your abundance as well. I, I think that's a trait that is pretty profound for you. Often you will support men in similar movements <laughs> that that at first glance, a lot of people would be like, oh my gosh, right? Like, don't help them. That's a competition. And you don't, I've never seen you act like that whatsoever, ever, ever. And, and it's impressive. So um, I think having that abundant mentality and your ability to check your ego when, when it comes to control and understanding that people want autonomy and some, and some flex, right, in what they're doing and you being okay with it. Those are great traits. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah I, pre- I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just lazy. And I'm like, yeah, sure, if you want to do it, do it, I'm not going to. <laughs> Either way, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I did think about with the uh, abundance thing, and this is a mentality I've had, and I've actually had this thought, and I've worked through that, because there are times in my life where I feel intimidated or have the scarcity mindset, like we all do, of course. Yeah. We, we realize things as a threat. And I think biologically we're hardwired to hoard resources. Uh, and we don't, we can't really, I don't believe differentiate between, you know, the berries that are going to produce, which are finite. Yeah. And the, the economic abundance that we've created in modern times, like uh, my success no longer has to come at your expense, which is a pretty cool pretty cool development yeah. in human history because typically it would right like if i want more lands i have to take yours if i want to kill more bison then there's going to be less bison for you to kill traditionally throughout human history it's finite but we've created a different type of society but here's what i thought i'm 40 uh, i'll be turning how old am i i'll be turning 43 that's now that's I'm how old you know I can't you're getting remember old, old. <laughs> I'll be turning 43 in, in a couple of weeks. And if I'm to live the life expectancy, I have less than 40 years left on this planet, which means that I'm not playing for five years, I'm playing for 40. And if I die sooner, then it doesn't really matter anyways. Right, that's what peop, people think that all the time. Like I have to get mine now. Bro, if you die sooner, it doesn't matter what you got, you're dead. I'm going to be here for 40 years, maybe. And I want to make sure that order of man is going for 40 years. I want to make sure my kids and their, their kids, my grandkids, maybe even great grandkids have learned what they need to learn. I want to, I, I just want to add value. I read a, I read a thing today on, Inst, on Facebook and I, and I think it was a Scandinavian country in the 1800s. They planted over 300,000 oak trees. And they planted these oak trees in a certain way in a certain forest because they knew if they did it this way, these oak trees would grow grow to be big and strong and straight and true. And they built it to develop and build boats for their navy. And they weren't able to harvest these oak trees until 150 years later. Now, 150 years later, we were using steel, so it didn't really matter, but that's beside the point. The point is... They were thinking 150 years into the future. We're going to plant these 300,000 oak trees right now, and our great-great-grandchildren will reap the benefit of what we've created or what we've done. That was a really cool lesson I picked up this morning. That is cool. That is cool. All right. Like-minded servants, what do each of your children say about you when you're not in the room? <clears throat> that'll know, show us <laughs> <laughs> go ahead that will show us the men we how we really line up what would your kids say i don't know i i don't know what they say all i can tell you is what i hope they say yeah yeah i, I thought about um, this well go ahead no let's hear what you have to say i'd well, love to hear I, your thoughts on this how's this and and i'm not i i think it varies i think it varies every day I, I think what they may not, what they'll say today is a little bit different than they'll probably say tomorrow and next week. Um, um, but I wanted to take advantage of the question and say the importance of us evaluating this, though, is critical. Mm-hmm. Right. 
It's really critical. And and I I I had this note my daughter wrote me, and it's it's my birthday was about a month ago. And she wrote this birthday, and my my dad passed away on my birthday. But I thought this was profound in regards to getting her insight into how she sees me. She says, Dear Dad, I'm sorry that your dad died, and I know you are really mad and sad, and you feel like you don't want to celebrate your birthday, but I don't want this to happen every birthday. So at least try to let go, and I love you so much. I hope you have an amazing day. Mm. So So cool. Her realizing how I show up or how she sees me, she's literally saying, translation, get over it. Because I don't want you being grumpy and mad and, you know what I mean, all these other things. And thus, your kids care. And not just care, but how you show up affects them. And I would probably argue she wrote that. Why? Because she's like, you're miserable (laughs) on this great day. Come on, Dad, let it go. Right? And show up a little bit more powerfully and be happy and be fun, you know, and not be this way. And, And thus... You know, dad's always mad or dad's grumpy or dad's mean. Man, I think it it highly matters. Um, And so great question, like-minded servants, (laughs) even though we haven't answered your question. I think it is. It's a thoughtful question. It's something that really makes you ponder and think, you know. I don't know what they say. I I, I know what they've said in the past. (laughs) It hasn't always been great. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope from a, from an interpersonal relationship level, I, I, I hope they, they would say that, Hey, dad really cared about us. You know, like he was active with us. It wasn't always easy and he couldn't make everything, but he always tried to be there. And I do, you know, I try to coach my kids teams and I try to go to their things. I can't make it to all of them. I've got four kids. I've got my own stuff. And of course with the custody schedule that changes the dynamic, you know, and like I've got, uh, one of my son's birthdays coming up. Well, he won't be with me this birthday. So I called him up and I said, hey man, can I take you to breakfast or lunch? Because you won't be with me Tuesday night. And he's like, in typical teenager fashion, he's like, no, I can't because I'm going to lunch with my girlfriend. I'm like, okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I put those reps in. And whether it works out or not, for whatever reason or not, it's okay. Like I, I want them to know that they're important to me and I try to reach out to them every day. Um, from, from another perspective, I, I just want them to see me chasing things that are important to me and significant to me. Um, goals and dreams and desires and ambitions and having fun and trying new things and experimenting and enjoying life. And that isn't something that I've always done, but it is something that I focused on over the past year and a half or so. I actually made this post on the Iron Council. I'm not sure if you saw it or not, but I said, when is the last time you did something fun? something different, something you've never done before. The thing that I'm doing right now, a couple of things actually. I've got some meat actually smoking on the Traeger right now. It's not something I really have ever done in the past. Uh, And another thing is my oldest son, I was talking about his birthday, he asked me about a month and a half, two months ago if I would be his lacrosse team photographer. Like, I don't know, I don't know anything about photography. I had a little Canon camera, uh, did a little research, spent about a grand in, you know, lenses and a bag and tripod and things like that. And I'm, I'm learning. It's fun. It's enjoyable. And not only is it enjoyable for me, I would like them to see that I'm pursuing things that I don't have any business pursuing. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think that's what I would want them to learn from me is, Hey, you know what? Dad didn't know what he was doing all the time, but man, he was willing to try. Like he was willing to put it out there and experiment and play and screw up and admit his faults and then like do new things. I, I would love for them to say that about me. Yeah. I, that being fun is resonating with me. I, mm. um, I downloaded the Alexa app on my phone. So it allows me to broadcast messages on every Alexa device in the house for the last oh, two days. Yeah, cool. Every single time we take a dump, I, I have an Alexa <laughs> message and I tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I think it's so funny. And it's like Alexa's voice and everyone's like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, yeah. And what does it say? Like Kip is going to the, your dad is taking a dump right now. No, I'll say having a really good poop 
you know, or <laughs> I don't know, just to be funny. <laughs> oh, and Asia's just, funny, just like, man. oh like my that. gosh, yeah. And I'll I'll that's even do awesome. it more often if someone else is in the house, just to <laughs> be extra enjoyable. It's okay. Uh, like, it really, I think we need to let loose. The thing that I've been doing, uh, and I've done this with my kids, but specifically for whatever reason, my girlfriend's daughter loves diarrhea jokes. Like, you know, like. <laughs> When your stomach starts to hurt and you feel a little squirt, diarrhea, you know, those yeah, type of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Sliding in it first. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you feel something burst. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> she's probably listening to this and she doesn't, I don't think that she appreciates it as much as I do, but her and I love doing that. It's just fun. Like we're just having fun and yeah. it's okay to have fun. And that's yeah. something I'm learning as well. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Colin Cottrell and Jimbo, they had two questions that are similar, so I'm, I'm packaging these two up. Colin asks, best piece of advice for someone going through a divorce? And then Jimbo's question is really the hardest part of a divorce. Um, I saw these questions. I think the answer is the same. The best thing that you can do when you're going through a divorce is if you know this is happening, and it's like done or it's, it is yeah. happening is knowing when to let go. Yeah. That's hard. What's the song? No one to hold them. No one to fold them. Yeah. I think hold them as long as you can I, because you made a vow, you made a commitment, you know, hold them as long as you can, but there's another party at play here. And so you got to know when to fold them. And I, I think I did it right personally through my own divorce. I, I held them as long as I could and then I realized then there was a very cathartic moment for me and I won't get into the, the details of it, but there was something that she had said that I realized mm, this done. is done. Yeah. And it was hard, man. I, and I'm, it was emotionally filled and there was tears on, on my part and it was hard. Uh, and I'm sure it was hard for her to say too, if I'm, if I'm being honest about it. Uh, but it was also super liberating super liberating. It's like, okay, finally I can let go and I can move on with my life and I can continue to work on myself and figure out what we're going to do with the financial arrangements and custody arrangements and all these other things. Um, so what would I say to somebody going through a divorce? No one to let go. What was the hardest part? Letting go. Yeah. It's hard, man. Like, You've been in a marriage, you've been committed to somebody, you, you gave yourself to somebody, you've been with them for, a, you know, in, in my situation, I was with my ex for 20 years. We were married, married for 18. That's a long time. So letting go of that, I really grappled and wrestled with that. But when I did let go, it allowed me to move on and drive on with my life. And also letting go, I think, is a little bit of forgiveness for yourself. A little, maybe not even forgiveness. I don't, I don't, I don't really know how to look at this, but a little bit of grace. Yeah. You know, I, I could have done better, but I didn't. And so now I'm learning the lessons and now I'm learning what I should have done and could have done and what I will do in future, uh, my, my future relationship. And, and just being not okay with it, but just coming to terms with it. Yeah. I, I really, when I hear letting go, I think it's letting go of the expectations of, of what mm -hmm. you thought it should have been or it shouldn't be and just dealing with what is so. Reality. Yeah, yeah reality. And, and I think where that allows grace to come in is being okay with wherever they are. And I think that's kind of the hardest part of it, right, of letting go. If we really let go, then you're not, you don't have a heart at war towards her when you see her, when she's with another guy. Like you, you start being okay with her moving on um, and, and, and seeing her for who she is and being, you know, with, with no expectation of the way, the way it should or should not be, if, if that makes sense. And I, I struggle with, I struggle with the same thing. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I, I dated. I dated on and off after my divorce and multiple times, you know, if she came knocking on the door and said, I want to put our family back together again, I was like, absolutely, let's go. So divorce is over, over, but I didn't let go for, 
like I, in my heart, I really didn't let go until about four years. Mm. But, but I remember it like it was yesterday and it was kind of a surreal moment where I was like, oh yeah, this isn't like, this will not ever work and, and, and come to terms with it and letting go was, was profound, but it took me a long time. Uh, and, yeah. and I kind of hurt myself a lot mentally, right. In that time of not letting go. Um, but it was what I needed, right. For me to have that confidence in, in, in moving on. Well, I guess Kip, since both of us say learning to let go, the, then the, the follow-up question is how do you let go? Yeah. What do you think? For me, I think learning to let go is, is dealing with reality. Uh, I, I think this is our biggest issue in a lot of cases in life. We have these expectations of the way that things should be or not. You know, uh, upset at work is like, oh, well, it shouldn't be this way. Well, guess what? But it's, but it's not that way. So deal in reality, deal in, in what is so as well as giving grace to other people and realizing there's agency and we can't mm. control people. And so that was my biggest thing is I felt I held on because it shouldn't be this way. My, I shouldn't have my family separated. I shouldn't have to be a part, part-time parent. It was Which all might these, be true, all yeah, of that. Yeah, but it doesn't matter whether I think that or not. The reality <laughs> is it is what it is. Yeah. And I can't control her and I need to be okay with wherever she chooses in life. And, and that was it. So it was really just coming to terms with, it was something outside of my realm of control. Um, and, and letting go of the past and dragging that into my present and future and dealing in the present and the present was she's moved on and you're not going to get her back and you're not going to have your family together full time. And, and this is your new lot. So now what are you going to do with it? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, those two, I didn't think about those two things. So I wrote, as you were talking, dealing with reality is something you said. And then another thing you said is having grace for others. I think those were two good things. The only other thing that I wrote down here that, that I think would add to that is just allowing yourself to explore a new reality. Hmm. Like what an exciting time possibility is now available. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And I know that sounds weird, especially if you're in the throes of it right now. It yeah. sounds weird to think that you have an exciting life ahead of you, but you actually do. Yeah. You, you have adventures and things that you can go on and uh, other, other, another woman that you can find and, and cultivate a, a new, maybe even better relationship with. You can try new things. You can take risks. Like it's actually pretty exciting when you choose to look at it like this. And I know there's going to be naysayers who listen to this podcast and they'll say things like, to me personally, like, well, you failed your family. Like, why don't you focus on that? Again, what's done is done. And I'm, I'm of course, I'm, I'm intimately aware of that and familiar with that. But that doesn't mean that I can't go out and create something new. And in fact, if I want to be the best father that I can be for my children, then I'm actually obligated to go do that mm -hmm. because I need to make myself into something that I wasn't previously. And I need new experiences. I need new information. I need new relationships that I can grow from in order to become somebody new. So man, if you're going through a divorce right now and you're at the pit of despair and trust me, I know what it is, Kip. I'll speak for you on this one. I know you know what it is. Absolutely. Have a little bit of hope and optimism if you can find it and know that life gets better. I was talking with my girlfriend the other day and I, and I, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, but we, we were talking about, and she's of course gone through hardships as well, how you know in those moments, it feels like it's catastrophic. <laughs> it, it feels like you're just in the pit of despair and life is literally over and maybe even consider taking your own life. I have those thoughts. I never acted on that. And I never seriously gave that any consideration, but I, I would be lying if I yeah. said I didn't have some of those thoughts. I did, of course. And it was horrible. And I remember how horrible it was, but it's weird not to feel that way today because yeah. I don't. I'm happy. I'm probably the happiest I've been in a really long time. I'm, I'm excited about 
the relationship I have with her. I'm re- excited about the relationship I have with my kids. I'm excited about this business. I, I'm recommitted to, to this movement. Like it's exciting. It's one of the best times of my life. And also I have this thing over here that isn't really that exciting or great about my history. Yeah. But it's okay. Like yeah. it's okay. You, it's so weird that we as human beings can just almost, I, I remember being in a lot of pain. It's, I can't even explain it. I remember being in a lot, in a lot of pain, but I, don't, I can't feel it the way that I did then. And it seems like a past life almost. And it hasn't even been that long. Human beings are amazing that way. Yeah, you, it's a transformation, a, a paradigm shift of how you saw the world. And so yeah. it's unrelatable to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. There's sure. one thing I so want to strange. call out and, and it came up in another question. So I'll take advantage of it. And Ryan, I don't want to speak for you here. So maybe you clarify for me, I was able to let go, not through anger and hate. I think some guys, they, they're, they get sideways they're, they're, There's a lot of anger and hate that is present. My ability to let go allowed me to love her genuinely without judgment. <laughs> so for me to do that, it was empathy increased and I see her with less judgment than I did before. Not more hate and you know what I mean? I moved on cause I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? It's like, no, that's not what I'm talking about when I say letting go. And I, I, I want to call that out cause I, I think guys might get that wrong that letting go is actually like, I'm letting go of them because I have all this heart at war towards them. You're not letting go of shit yeah. if you still have a heart at war towards something. Well, and a lot of guys will say, well, it, but it is. It's like, okay, she is, she is this way. She did do this thing. It's like, that's true. That might be true. Like she might be the most conniving bitch of all time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and how does that serve you now? Hasn't. It doesn't. So in my personal situation, I made a commitment. I'm, I don't talk about her ill. I don't actually have anything ill to say about her. But I'm not mad. I, there was. I'm not mad. I think there was an injustice done. But I'm not mad. But you yeah. know what's interesting? Is she would probably also say there was an injustice done. Totally. And so I'm not mad. I made the best decisions I could. I think she made the best decisions she could. She thinks I'm wrong, probably. I think she's wrong. And, but again, it's reality. And so I'm not going to, I'm just going to choose not to be mad. It's kind of like love. You know, we, we, when we're young, I think we believe that love is just a feeling like, oh, I love this person. And as you get older, you realize that love's a decision. You know, it, it, yes, it's a feeling too. Don't get yeah. me wrong. But also, like, there's a lot of things that come up where you decide, no, I am going to love this person because I committed to this person. And, and being mad is the same way. You, you choo- you're choosing to be mad. And you might have things to be mad about. But the great thing about being a human being is you can wake up today and you can decide, you know what, I don't think I'm going to be mad today. It's a choice. And then you're not. Like that is an incredible superpower that we as human beings have that other animals just don't have. Yeah. So we ought to utilize it. Michael Merrill... Ryan, most impactful, memorable discussion or topic with the guests so far and why? Oh, I hate these. I mean, I appreciate I the question. It's Michael. Give me, so get up in that. I know. I know. Uh, Man, there's so many. Uh, one that stands out was my interview with John Eldridge because his book, Wild at Heart, changed my life. Yeah. One of the f- most frustrating things about when I was reading that book is I remember I was reading it on a plane somewhere. I don't know where I was going and I got off the plane and I got to wherever I was going and I looked in my bag and I didn't have the book. I left it in the back seat of the, of the person in front of me. It's like, dang it. But I, I remember just being so enthralled with that book and like scooping up every word and trying to internalize all of it. So that was really good when I was able to have a conversation with him. Um, my first interview with Jocko was, totally weird and awkward and uncomfortable for me. It was kind of when he was getting started and he wasn't as polished as he is now. And I wasn't as good as I am now. And so it was a really weird, I'd ask him like, 
how do you, how do you become Here, more disciplined? I'll do like, it. You just do it. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> like, one word response is oh, good. Yeah, do it. Good discipline. Like, do you care to elaborate? Move on. No, there's no. nothing to elaborate on. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You're weak. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> thanks for the assist on that one. <laughs> But it was still pretty exciting for me. I remember yeah. how excited I was doing that interview. Uh, Tim Tebow was a great interview. I, I talked about him earlier. The guy's passion and enthusiasm for his work is incredible to me. I don't think I've ever met a person like that. Um, Goggins was an interesting one. You know, I, I, I don't want to be like David Goggins. I don't want to live my life like he does. I'm not interested in that. Um, but also, again, we have to have those kind of people yeah, who just are so vested in up. their thing. Yeah, and they show you what's possible in certain yeah. realms of life. Uh, when I walked into the room, I, I, I got a hotel room, a, a, a nice, like, you know, suite in, in a, I can't even remember where we were, maybe Vegas. like Bellagio or something in, yeah. in Vegas. And I got this nice suite for us. And I said, hey, I'm going to be here. Or maybe he was there and I got a room there, something. I can't remember exactly. And um, had, a, had a film crew come down. And uh, when he walked in the room, he was, I mean, it was palpable. <laughs> it was palpable. Like you could, I'm like, this is the David Goggins. This is Goggins. Yeah. And he was in his workout gear. He's like, oh man, sorry, I'm running a little bit late. I just got done with a workout. And I said, no problem. Like I got everything set up. We're ready to go. So we sat down. We had a really good really good interview you guys should go listen to that one that was one of my favorite it was so wild <laughs> so wild and then at the end of the interview we kind of got wrapped up and i was like hey we're all done and we're kind of closing things down i thought we were gonna shoot the shit a little bit and he's like hey i gotta go i gotta go work out and i was like didn't you just go work out he's like yeah like i looked at him like he was the weird one and he looked at me like <laughs> i was the weird one i'm like and he could tell I didn't connect. He's like, this is my second workout. I'm like, oh, okay, got it, which was an hour later, you know, so hour and a half yeah. maybe. But, uh, yeah, I got a lot of good memories, man. It's been, a, it's been a hell of a ride. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. John, jeez, uh, these names. Um, John Gal Chabar Hair. <laughs> Who knows? Good morning. <laughs> my dad passed away after a long battle with cancer a month ago. Any suggestions mm. on how to deal with the loss? I'm struggling a bit as I was at work when he passed and I didn't get to the hospital in time. There's things I wanted to say and ask. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't get to the hospital on time when my dad died either. He died yeah. a half an hour before I got there. And you flew. Like, I, I think you flew, huh? You tried to catch no, a I drove. Plane. You drove? I should have flown. Yeah. I drove. Hmm. Hmm. How do you deal with it? I think, I think we have a really unhealthy relationship with death. <laughs> you know, like we, do, we, we postpone it. We don't want it to happen. There's people talk about that it. are talking seriously about living forever. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we don't really have any sort of connection with the afterlife or, or believe even necessarily that there is one. And my thought is this, is like, I believe in an afterlife. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but even if it doesn't, well, it doesn't really matter then, does it? Yeah. You know, if, if, if I die and it goes black, I'm not going to be there to experience that. So I'm going to choose to have some hope and optimism of what's going on in the future and what's going on in that afterlife for me. You know, that's faith, right? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of this is, well, he, one thing he said, our, our guy said, is he said he had things he wanted to ask him and questions and unsaid things. Go ahead and write those things down and, and write that letter to your dad. Yeah. Just go ahead and write those things down. Hey, dad, like for me, it was like, why weren't you there all the time? Like, did you love me? Because there was moments where I'm like, he doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me. Yeah. And so I really, I didn't write them down like I'm encouraging you to do, but I, I, I should probably do that. But I did spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I think you can still ask the question because when you do everything that you can do, you're able to let go of the rest. You haven't done everything that you can do yet because you think there's no time to do it. Well, just because you ask a question doesn't mean you're going to get the answer from the person who's responding or you would like to respond. Yeah. And in this case, he's not even available to do that. So... Ask the question. Go to his grave. Sit at his grave. Just ask him questions. 
I think you'd be pretty amazed as I've done that. I've, cre- I've, I've developed a lot of grace and forgiveness for my dad after he passed away because I'm willing to ask those questions. When I say, hey, dad, why didn't you love me? He, he did love me. Of course he did. Yeah. In my mind, I didn't as a kid, but now when I ask that question, what comes to mind for me is he didn't know how to love me the way that I wanted to be loved. Maybe there was some uh, barriers to being able to do that because we weren't together. We lived in different states for a lot of my childhood as well. But he it's not that he didn't love me. It's other things that I couldn't see when I was a child. You know, if I said, why weren't you there on these things? He might say, no, I was there. Like, maybe I didn't call you, but I was thinking about you. You know, I, for example... I can't be at all my kids' games. My son, my oldest son had games in Vegas this weekend. I couldn't be there because I was coaching my youngest son's soccer team. And, and he could say, well, why weren't you there? I'm like, bro, I was there. <laughs> yeah. Like, I thought about you. I, t- I texted you before. I, I said, hey, good luck today. After the game, how'd the game go? Like, I'm vested in it. I can't physically be at everything, but I'm vested in it. And, you're, and with your father, it might be the same thing. But I, I say go ahead and ask those questions and just let yourself sit in them a little while and see. And you might, you might give him a little grace that he maybe deserves and you might afford yourself some grace that you deserve. Totally. When my, when my dad passed away, it was funny because I had a lot of people like, you know, reach out. Hey, Kip, I'm sure he was a great guy. You know, it's evident of, of how you show up in the world. You know what I mean? And it was kind of funny because um, he wasn't that great. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, I, I would probably even argue that uh, most of my siblings had major relationship issues with this guy. And, and so a lot of people assumed that I just had this amazing relationship with my father. Um, but like you... I I was actually afforded a lot of grace because I chose to see him who he was and forgive him for, for who he wasn't. That's it. And, and you, you want to get complete with your dad. You know what getting complete with someone is? It's, it's forgiving them and having some empathy and understanding that they are who they were. And guess what? They did the best they could do because that's what they did. And who are we to say that we understood someone's upbringing and their shortcomings? What things did he shield me from that I have no idea? Right? What what things did he do? What heart um, hurt and frustration and sorrow and sadness did he have in his heart as my father that I never knew about? The more I think about those kind of things, the more I realize that we are arrogant to ever assume that we should, we know how someone should or should not show up in the world. We don't know. We really don't. And we we should be a lot more empathetic and forgiving for, for, for the interactions that people have in our lives, especially our parents. And you know this, we're both fathers. Do your dad love you? Absolutely. He did. Why? Because you're a father. Now, did he screw up in regards to showing it? Did he not do the things that we thought they should have or should not have done? Absolutely. But to, to say that they didn't care, that I, I think would be folly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, that's well said. And, and look, if, you're, if you had a great, we don't know, maybe you had a great relationship with your father. Yeah, even easier. And, <laughs> and here's, here's what I would say. Go watch Lion King. I know that sounds like a silly answer, <laughs> but go watch when Simba is confronted by the, by the baboon. I can't remember his, his name, the baboon's name. Yeah. And he introduces him to his father who's already died. And his father comes in the form of clouds and says, remember me. Like you've forgotten who you are, therefore you've forgotten me. And I think a lot of people... A lot of men fall into that trap when their fathers die, especially if they have close relationships 
I think in a lot of ways it could be harder for somebody who has a close relationship, right, than somebody who doesn't, obviously. Uh, and then they, they self-destruct. And they're like, I love my father. He meant everything to me. He meant the world to me. I love him. We had a great relationship. Then why are you acting like you are? Because you're dishonoring your father. Yeah. You loved your father. You admired him. You respected him. You appreciated him. He poured everything into you. You had this great relationship. He sacrificed for you. And you're acting like an asshole? Wrong answer. Remember who you are, a son of him, and honor his life by acting the way that he taught you to act. And I promise you, he wouldn't have you wallow in your own self-pity. He wouldn't have you crying over his grave. He would have you go out there and lead your own family, start your own business, get in shape, fix your mind, fix your heart, fix your soul. Like go out in there and pursue interesting things to you. That's what he would have you do. So as maybe not as delicately as I can say it, but as plainly as I can say it, shame on you a little bit. If you've used this death to become less than what he would have you be and what he taught you to be, go be that guy. Yeah. He would appreciate that. Yeah. You, you and wanna, then you'll reunite. Yeah. You want to honor and make your parents happy? Live a great life. That's all that we want for our kids. Yeah. No, no yeah. different. David Osbernson, he had a similar question, and I think we could just tag on to it just really quickly. He said that his dad passed away in August, and he keeps having dreams about him being alive, and he wakes up and realizes that he's not. And his question is, is why do I still have these dreams, and why shouldn't I just feel I should move on emotionally? I don't think you have to move on. I agree. Like, you... I mean, I hear what you're saying. Like, you don't want to feel this way. I get it. Like, but you don't need to move on from who he was or his legacy. Like, when I look at myself, I look like my dad. Now, I didn't know him real well. I didn't have a lot of interactions. I, I loved him. He loved me. I know that. But when I see pictures of myself or look in the mirror, I'm like, holy shit. Like, and especially as I get a little gray, I look more and more like my dad. Like, you don't have to move on from that. And it's okay. Also, you need to know this. It's okay to be sad. Like, it's okay to cry. Yeah. It's okay to be heartbroken or to feel sorrow or to miss somebody. I almost feel like in your question, like, you shouldn't feel that way. Why shouldn't you? He was so important in your life. You loved him. You honored him. Like, he loved you. You guys had a great relationship. Of course, you should feel it. Maybe allow yourself to experience and feel it more than you are right now. But then also take action. Also do, and so when he visits you in your dreams, like be grateful. Yeah, totally. Like he, what you're, he's visiting you in his dreams and you guys are having conversations and he's alive. That's awesome. What is he telling you? Do that. What lessons is he teaching you beyond the grave? Do that. I think that's a blessing. Me too. Yeah, when I read that question, I was like, no, don't. Don't move on from that. Embrace it. Enjoy no it. Yeah. Yeah, use it to use it to help to show up powerfully in the world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Take a couple more? Yes, sir. Jersey Tony, what was the most important lesson learned during the Order of Man journey? The Order of Man journey. This question is for both Ryan journey. and Kip. Thanks, Jersey, for giving me that option to respond. I was going to respond <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you I so was much for silence him when he started talking. I know. Thank you so much for all that you guys do. <laughs> Most important lesson. Um, well, I think for me, it's been the lesson I learned over the past year and a half now, almost two years. Well, closer to two years, is like you don't have to be perfect to do this. I thought I had to be perfect. There was mm -hmm. a time when I was going through the, the, the throes of my alcohol abuse and, and the demise of, of my marriage where I thought, oh, I'm going to have to throw in the towel. Like I seriously considered that. Yeah. Never looked any further than just considering it in my own mind. But there was a time where I really thought that. 
And then what I realized through my own actions and then starting to share some of what was going on, I realized that I don't have to be perfect to do this. In fact, I'm maybe more qualified now than I was before because I have a greater level of understanding and empathy for somebody who's going through what might drive them to belong to this movement, which is substance abuse or a divorce or any number of things that people deal with. And I'm more empathetic and understanding to what they're dealing with because I've dealt with this, some of it myself now. So a lot of our inability or, or unwillingness to take action stems from our desire to be perfect in order to do it. And you just don't. You just need to be honest. And I wasn't always honest, but now that I am, being honest even about my shortcomings and indiscretions and screw-ups and failures and setbacks, not only does it empower me, but it connects me at a deeper level to the people who want to be connected to this movement, unlike I ever was connected with those people before. Yeah. You know, I think one of my biggest lessons while being with you over the last, geez, what, eight years or seven years or so, um, has been the natural order of men coming into the Iron Council. And and the IC is open right now. You guys have pretty much this week to sign up um, to join us in that brotherhood. But most men join the Iron Council to focus on themselves. And they think they are the focus, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to join here. I'm going to get my fitness dialed in. I'm going to I'm going to get these things and I'm bettering myself. And and that's not bad. I'm not saying that's bad. But guys that get it move past that. And then they realize that they're in the Iron Council for the other men on their team. They're in the Iron Council (coughs) so they can show up more powerfully with their family with their kids, with their spouse. And it no longer becomes about them as much as fine tuning the tool to serve other individuals. And man, that is so powerful. And don't get me wrong, sometimes that's hard to imagine putting others first (laughs) when we're broken and we need to work on ourselves. But there's the natural order of progression I've seen over and over again in the Iron Council. And the guys that that continue to move on to the next stage, they step into the stage of service. And it's the service of their teams and it's the service of their communities. And they start playing a bigger game. Not the game of, I just want some financial stability and I want to be in shape. They're, they've taken on something bigger than that. And that is really what the movement's about more than anything else. Imagine, I I agree with everything you said. Imagine if they came into it with that mentality, how much further ahead they'd be. Yeah. Yeah. I had this buddy who I got into the financial planning business over a decade ago. Yeah, like closer to 20 years ago now. That's wild. Old man. Uh, Yeah. And we got into the business together. And then we, we ended up being business partners. I eventually sold my business to him when I stepped away from the financial planning practice. And he would whenever I'd complain about something, he'd say, therefore what? And it was so annoying. (laughs) I'd complain or gripe about something. He's like, therefore what? And I'd get so bothered. And I look back at it now. I'm like, that's actually pretty good. Like, therefore what? Okay. And, and I think about that a lot with our goals. You know, a guy will say, I'd like to make a lot of money. Therefore what? Why? Well, so I can serve my family. There you go. Yeah, that's a better motive. Or I want to, I want to, I want to be fit. Why? So I don't know. So I can be more connected with my wife, or we can be more intimate together, or I can have energy to go play with my kids, or I can coach their teams. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Having a better body is means to an end. Having more money is means to an end. Having more knowledge or expertise or a daily plan or whatever all these guys talk about online is a means to you serving other people more effectively. And the, the better we can keep that at the forefront of our mind, our job is to serve as men. Like you're built to serve. Yeah. Physically, mentally, emotionally, you're built to serve. And if you're not serving, you know it even, even subconsciously and you feel inadequate because you are. Yeah. You're not doing what you're meant to do. Make a bunch of money, get in shape, 
develop your mind, develop your heart, develop your soul. Therefore, you can serve other people. That's the ultimate objective. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Ryan Clark, 1980. Last question. Last one today. Your kids turn against you because their mother told them lies about you. You haven't seen them for about a year. Do you let them come to you or do you chalk it up as a loss? No, no, dude, don't even, don't even. But number one, that's a false dichotomy, okay? But those are your fucking kids, man. Don't you ever for a second chalk that up to a loss. Like, I, I will get passionate about that. And I don't even think you want to. I think you're frustrated right now, and rightfully so. Yeah. But you don't want to do that. You know you don't want to do that. Don't you dare do that. Okay, now, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if it ever is repaired. I don't know if you are ever satisfied with the resolution. I don't know. I don't know the future. But don't you dare chalk any of that up to a loss. Because those are your kids. There's a lot of things I'll chalk up to a loss, but my kids are not one of them. So, and also, don't just let them come to you. That's too passive. Yep. That's your weak. Kids. That's pathetic. That's cowardly. So then, that's the false dichotomy you're playing with here. Here's what I suggest. Number one, know all of your rights as a father and obtain great legal counsel. Because there might be some fatherhood rights being infringed upon right here. I don't know, but that's an avenue we need to explore. And you need to protect your rights as a father because those kids need you in their life. And so fight like a man would fight. Figure out all the legal ramifications and all the legal ways to make sure that you get access to your children. That's one of the things I would do. The other thing that I would do is I would go to work on myself, becoming the best possible person that I could be. That means daily reading, soul searching, journaling, scriptures, prayer, meditation, physical fitness, developing new skills to make a bunch of money, and I'm gonna get myself into the best possible position that I possibly can, regardless of whether or not I have my kids in contact with me or not because that's gonna make you more attractive and that's gonna get your mind right for what's to come because it's gonna be a battle. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And it's also gonna help you be more attractive when and if your kids do come around. Okay, this is the hardest thing I'm gonna tell you to do. Learn to be, I'll, I'll, let me say it this way. Start playing the game with her. You gotta play the game. I know you don't like it. I know you have hostility potentially towards her. I know you, you she, maybe she didn't take your kids away from you. I know all of that. I get it. I know it. You gotta play the game. And the game is how can I be amicable? How can I be respectful? How can I communicate with my kids without going around her necessarily? And, undermining what she's trying to do. And I know it's not right. I know it. It's not right that you should have to do that. It's not, that's why I say get legal counsel. But the better you get at the game, the more likely it is you get to see your kids. And isn't that the end result? Yeah. So there might be some things that you need to do that you have to swallow your pride that you're not totally comfortable with, that don't feel right to you, but you know what is right? Figuring out a way to get access to your kids again. Absolutely. And here's the other thing, Ryan, that you might have to deal with. They may not like you. Yeah, true. And guess what? It's not about you. Welcome to parenthood. Good parents, it's not about you. It's not about you being liked. It's not about whether they want to be around you. Absolutely, it has nothing to do with you. And you need to get present is what you need to do as a father for them. And that has to take a higher priority than your ego around whether your kids want to be around you or not. That's not your job. Your job is not to have them like you. Your job is to do your part as a father and let them know that they're loved, whether they love you or not. And so you might have to chalk that up and you might have to, it's going to be hard. 
and you're going to want to have to force your hand and, and, and show up in a really powerful way. And you may be thinking they don't want to be here. They don't want to hang out with you. All these horrible thoughts are going to cross your mind, but you got to show up powerfully anyway. Why? Because it's your job. You're a parent. You're a father. Show up as a powerful father, regardless of all other parties. And what will more likely happen is eventually, over a long period of time, and trust me, it'll, it'll probably be a long time before you get this benefit. And then your son will, son or daughter someday will say, Dad, man, thank you. Thank you for not quitting on us. Thank you for being an amazing father despite all those hardships from years and years ago. And you might get that benefit. But the reality of it is you got to stay strong and you're not going to see the results of this for a really long time. But it's not about you. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. That's a tough one. Good one to end on because I know a lot of guys are in that similar situation. A lot of questions about divorce, childhood, or uh, uh, fathers, uh, children, being a son. A lot of good questions. Powerful stuff today. Yeah, absolutely. Call to action earlier. Iron Council's open. This is our exclusive brotherhood where you would come in, get assigned to a battle team, and pretty much get on the court of life. I love that analogy. I think most people are victims of the game. They're sitting up in the stands watching things happen, being passive, their emotions being driven, whether their team wins or loses. Iron Council is putting the jersey on, getting on the court, and taking control of, of how you show up in, the wor- in this world. And we have systems and teams in place to, to assist in that process. But you got to be fully committed and engaged to get the value of it. If you're ready to be fully committed and engaged with us, go to orderofman.com slash iron council and sign up. That open enrollment's going to close within the next week. So you need to act before the 1st of April to, to join us there. Once again, orderofman.com slash iron council. New or not new, but uh, inventory resupplied. restocked, resupplied. Yep, some hats and whatnot over at the Order Hat of Man shirts store. Are coming, flags are back in there, so we got some stuff coming back, which is good. It's exciting to see. Yeah, so that's store.orderofman.com, and of course, as always, you can connect with Mister Mickler on the socials X and the Gram at Ryan Mickler. Awesome. Guys, great questions today. Hopefully, as always, we gave you something to consider and think about. Uh, We'll be back on Friday for our Friday Field Notes. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.